the Apostle Paul writing says this, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Probably ten minutes of silence or nine minutes <laughs> is the appropriate way to respond to such a scripture, isn't it? But I'm sorry to tell you I'm going to put some words in the space as well. And um, I want to make a case in this short homily um, for Zoom. The case goes like this, and it's around these sorts of questions. What do you see when you zoom out on our world, on your world, what do you see? The genius of the green planet is that by using time-lapse photography and through the most extraordinary technological achievements and care, and sometimes slight manipulation so that you film a giant lily in a studio in Hampshire, I think it was, or whatever it was, <laughs> as it grows. Through uh, close-ups, as well as satellite imagery, so you can see the changes over a whole swathe of forest, both forest going, but also forest coming, so it's not always depressing. <laughs> Through the whole close-up, zooming in and out, time-lapse, you get a sense of this extraordinary planet in a way you just don't by what you got told at school or even by reading a book or of course nowadays going on the internet. It's just, you, you come away from it going, whoa, don't you? Yeah. If you don't, you should, sorry. <laughs> or, or even, whoa, what a wonderful world. And then you sing the song, of course, <laughs> with appropriate sax at different points, Yinka. What a wonderful world. And, um, the thing is, what we're being let in on is something which we know is there. In a way, it's not a true mystery. Science has been telling us about these things for a long time. It's just that it can uh, tell us even more about it or show us even more about it now. It's not a true mystery, but it is mysterious, isn't it? It is a sort of behind the scenes thing. It is a, yesterday there was no plant peeking out of that crack in my, uh, in my local pavement and today there is. Now, you know, to, to be able to zoom in on it and close up on it and time lapse it makes you think, how extraordinary. There's just this amazing energy that's at work in the planet. A God-given energy and creativity and uh, desire to flourish. And we're supposed to be partners in that. And it seems to me that actually this great big picture, this great big zoom picture is part of what the Apostle Paul is wanting to offer to us in Ephesians. And it fits so well, Sharon, with what you shared about people coming from Hong Kong. It fits so well, Arthur, with what, uh, Arthur, with what you shared about this global vision and working out what w is ours to do as we partner in the global vision. This great vision... Uh, uh, of the mystery of God's will according to his good pleasure set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. There you have it everybody. That's what we're part of. That's the great vision that we're meant to be about. And every time you zoom in close, 
you are reminding yourself of the big picture and the small picture all at the same time. And uh, inevitably there, you know, no talk now is complete without uh, the next slide uh, of a king kingfisher. So uh, I do need to tell you, I did get there first. <laughs> Well, the kingfisher got to me first, back in St. Cuthman's in around 2010, Cuthman's St. Cuthman's Retreat Centre. Uh, but Slimbridge Wildfowl Centre, which some of you know, helped to sort of deepen and uh, uh, inspire afresh. And now, because we re live near the River Stour, actually we know uh, the piece of river where you can, to say, to use what Jeff said, you can put your place, uh, yourself in the place of being able to see a kingfisher, but you can never guarantee it but we do know that they are living uh, along there and fishing actively, uh, especially at the moment in the winter. It's zooming, incidentally I took this picture and I thought I'd tell you about me, the fact that I took this picture, not because I'm a photographer, but because actually um, I've made some effort to be able to get the picture by, I've got a monoscope, okay, you know what a monoscope is? It's half of a binocular, okay? <laughs> Uh, so you can zoom in and out, and then I've got this plastic contraption that, that screws onto the monoscope and has a little bit where your iPhone can slide in, and you, you carefully slide it so that the iPhone camera and the uh, viewing uh, point of the monos monoscope line up, and then, not looking at all clunky or stupid, you hold it in the right general right direction, looking at the phone, and then you take your picture. So that's how that looks quite zoomed in. It's not all zoomed from a phone. So I've no idea why I told you that, but it was just, <laughs> it's just the sense that you have to take some energy. You have to be intentional about zooming in as well as zooming out, don't you? you to use the language again, you have to want to be, desire to be attentive, intentional. There is something we can do, although the gift is of grace. Next slide, please. And then um, I wanted to um, particularly show us this picture as well. Some of you have, have this on this wall. This is a very popular picture. It's Georgia O'Keeffe, Oriental Poppies. And uh, what happened with Georgia O'Keeffe, especially her partner and then husband uh, Stieglitz, who was a famous photographer, they lived in New York and they realised that actually everyone was marvelling at this uh, amazing, continuously going up skyscraper city that they were living in. But in the meantime, big was everything and you didn't see the little things. So what she began to do is to paint flowers, close up to flowers, but on a large canvas. So I've been to a Georgia O'Keeffe exhibition in London some years ago and she painted large flowers so that you really see what otherwise in skyscraper world you miss. And of course no artist particularly is doing just an illustrative exercise. They want you to see what they see of course or they put it into it. Uh, as those of you that are painters and so on know. But she invites us to zoom in and look close. And the Apostle Paul zooms in and looks close to those who are at Ephesus or whoever were involved in the circulation of these letters. And actually, he sees something which is part of the bigger picture. In fact, 15 to 23, arguably, are a mirror of the first 14 verses because they, they zoom in on what actually can happen for that group of Christians in a way that actually is part of God's big purpose. So he says, verse 15, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. Stop there. <laughs> you are included, is what he's wanting to say. You're part of this big vision, everything being gathered together. You're part of it. Every one of you is part of it. Your church is a part of it. Where they've got faith in Christ and where they're having a go at loving each other, yeah? Is that right? Incidentally, that's fairly simple. That's fairly slowed down church, isn't it? Faith in Christ, love for each other. <laughs> and um, one of the things I want to do at this moment is just to thank you for, during the pandemic, the way that you've stayed putting your faith in Christ and as best you can, loving others. Thank you. Well done. That's of God. All the other things that are full of our, in our programmes and so on can be of God too, but that's at the heart of it. Don't diss that. 
or think it's only a little bit or just a start of it. It's the big thing. Paul says when you do that, you place yourself as part of the big thing that God is doing. So, and this is all in the context as we carry on of what's been an incredibly tough time. The, uh, the storms of life, uh, local, national, global, you've got your own version of that. The winds of doubt. Who hasn't actually had some self-doubt? Even the most confident of people over the recent months, haven't you? Um, and for many people, actually, it's been a, it's been a deal breaker. They've had to withdraw, retreat, give up. The waves of fear, we've already heard o over our time that actually anxiety, this is the age of anxiety, it was the age of anxiety before the pandemic, now it's the age of anxiety uh, 2.0, isn't it? And then of course alongside all of that is the effect it has on our hopes on our hopes, battered hopes, is part of the experience. So looking at these signs, uh, the flower brought up large, the kingfisher being brought up large, the faith and love being brought up large, and keep on doing it, I'm sort of echoing some of the things that Jeff was offering us, but actually it's so, so important, this sense of celebrating the uh, ordinary faith, <laughs> whatever that looks like, <laughs> the ordinary love, whatever that looks like, it's never ordinary, is it? And keep on doing so. And knowing that our people know that that matters. It's not always got to be spectacular. So these are signs and they point us to the bigger thing that is part of God's purposes. So next slide. Symbols, says Augustine, or said Augustine, symbols are powerful because they're the visible signs of invisible realities. And every time we notice uh, uh, some more trusting God, even though the circumstance is difficult, some love shared with another person when it, within or outside the church, actually it's a sign and symbol of this bigger thing. So really this talk is about hope. <laughs> it's about hope. Hope, of course, isn't someone who's optimistic. Henry Naum was asked, uh, are you an optimist? And he said, no, but I am hopeful. Not an optimist, but I am hopeful. And um, in my best moments, I know that deep down there is this sense of hope that God is about something in God's planet, in God's universe, in our world, in our lives, which represents the future that he's bringing about. We're part of it. And he will not be frustrated in his good purposes. Is that the, is that the big thing? Yeah? So hope, says Abraham Heschel, is a seed of eternity planted in the soul. It's deep down, sometimes it's very buried. You don't know that it's even there sometimes because you're so battered, but it's there. And uh, Teresa White, in a terrific book that I commend to you for Lent, writes this, seeds of eternity emerge little by little. Hope is born in the readiness to wait on God, to wait patiently for what we long for, believing that God has our best interests at heart. hope and of course inspiration i pray that the god of our lord jesus christ the father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your hearts enlightened you'll know what is the hope to which he's called you this is the gift of god it's not something we can manufacture it's not something we can as it were reinforce by necessarily singing more loudly and whistling more strongly it's not about that. It's a great deep sense of something which the Holy Spirit gives to us. And if you want to pray, look, it's really important that we pray for each other in terms of health, well-being, all those things. Um, but actually, if you really want to pray for someone, pray this prayer, that they'd have a sense of their eyes being opened, their hearts being enlightened, a sense of God's wisdom and the hope uh, that God is working for us. How are you being inspired and empowered at this time? If you focus, as inevitably we have to a bit, but if you focus on some of the things around that are difficult and discouraging, you can absolutely guarantee your hopes will be battered and your sense, your level of hope will uh, decline. Of course it will. 
So we've got to have a sense of what are the signs of God at work, knowing that it's part of this bigger, bigger picture. Zoom in and zoom out, okay? So you're relieved to know it's not that sort of zoom, by the way, that I'm a fan of. <laughs> we've had enough of that, but it served us well. And then we have to ask this question, what sort of power? And um, what sort of power? And uh, as we carry on to the next slide, it's this sort of power is what the Apostle describes. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. It's a power that can take a dead person and somehow constitute them with a new resurrection body and then enable them to be at God's right hand, all of which I haven't got the first idea about, have you? I mean, I genuinely don't, how, do, how does that work? And the, the problem is that if we use power in the way we're accustomed to nowadays, which is electric charge, jet engines, uh, enough rocket uh, fuel and uh, so on to get you to the moon, it's not the right sort of power. <laughs> Sorry and all that. The resurrection power does indeed transform, incidentally we're not risen or resurrected yet, you do know that, don't you? It's really important to say that's still to come. Someone that we love that's died, may they rest in peace and rise in glory, that's still to come. But the resurrection power that's there enables us somehow to live in the midst of the storms of life and where there's battered hopes and actually still be hopeful and still keep on putting our faith in Christ and still loving others and still believing in the future of the church which has got a glorious inheritance. All of those things. And the resurrection power that we actually are able to look at, uh, Jesus was sort of surprisingly invisible, everybody. He chose when to appear to his disciples they couldn't manufacture it, a bit like the kingfisher. <laughs> they could go to sometimes when he said, where he said they should go, Jerusalem or Galilee. But on the whole, they actually just had to marvel at it when it happened. But it wasn't a da-da, everybody. Look at how rocket-fueled I am. It just wasn't like that. And if we make it like that when we use this sentence, we are not really being true to resurrection, even though we know it's extraordinary. It's a power to keep on bearing with the storms of life, the opposition, in Paul's case, the imprisonment. Every discouraging sign around that said, this great thing that you're talking about that God's doing ain't happening. It's the power to keep on being strong about that and committed to that, that resurrection power. And of course, it's knowing that uh, there are loads of people with agendas around. You've got a few in your church, haven't you? You've got a few, so have I. And in wider society and in government and politics and business and education, you know, talk about a load of uh, uh, heady agendas. There's loads of them <laughs> around. But there's a, a greater authority. There is a greater authority than all of these. And God's purposes will not be frustrated, will not be frustrated. Um, the words for power, by the way, here are around strength and energising and authority. And I wish, really, the translators would stick to those words. There are different words used in this passage. But strengthening, uh, knowing who has the authority ultimately, as dissenters, we've always said that was important, uh, and, of course, that energising so that we can keep going. And that's different just, just a sort of a base resilience, it's more than that. So, um, this is a pretty cool vision, isn't it? Uh, an extraordinary vision. Um, wouldn't be too terrible if once a week at least we read through this again, or the Colossians uh, version of it. Wouldn't be so terrible if we did. Wouldn't be so terrible if our people kept on sensing that. Are we offering songs and hymns and readings and liturgy uh, that keep on echoing this? We're part of the big story. You're in it already, but we're part of this big story. Wouldn't be so bad, would it? Hopeful, hope-filled, hope-empowered. And um, I want to finish with this, which is uh, uh, a reference to uh, Charles Peguy, who uh, 
who was, um, I know nothing about him really, but I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'll t tell you a bit about something I have noticed about him. Uh, a French poet, he died in 1914, having been called up uh, in the First World War, and he could see the gathering clouds before uh, Europe got towards 1914. And um, so he died at 41. But before that, one of his most enthusiastic themes was the theme of hope. And he wrote a poem about three sisters. And the three sisters are faith, hope, and charity. Yeah, faith, hope, and charity. It's a, it's a beautiful poem. In it, um, actually, he, he puts himself in the place of God and God, in the poem, marvels at the hope that human beings have, despite what's going on. It's a lovely, lovely way of uh, getting in touch with hope. So God is really stunned that people are still hopeful, despite everything, you know, so, um, even though God's the source of hope. And as it goes on, he places faith, hope and charity together as sisters, but faith and charity are older sisters. Hope is the little sister in between. And the picture is of hope being the one that leads faith to deepen and to keep on being active. Hope is the little sister that leads love to keep on being expressed. Do you see how it works? It's a beautiful poem and a beautiful idea. A bit like this. So, uh, this is Alison and myself with our eldest granddaughter who's uh, all of two years, eight months. And uh, we were actually, on this occasion, we were out at Longleat. But it was one of those great occasions where uh, we persuaded her, she's better at holding hands now rather than just running off. We persuaded her to be in the middle of us. But of course, inevitably, Grandpa wanted to do the swinging thing, which I soon regretted because she didn't want to stop. And I, I knew there was a limit. Um, and so as we were walking along, she just landed, by the way, in this photo. We didn't have one with her feet in the air. But as we were doing this swinging, we would count one, two, three, and then she would, well, actually she didn't. She had a different one, two, three. So we just had to leap her up in the air when we could feel the tug on her arms and that she'd left, taken her feet off the ground. But she just kept leading us and leading us in this sort of um, uh, clunky, sort of hope-filled, irrepressible, can't put me down, toddle away. Um, hope together with uh, old grandpa. I don't know whether I'm faith or charity, probably neither. Um, and Alison can be both, but anyway, I was part of it. Hope, leading us forward. Hope, zooming in on the micro, zooming out on the macro, this great purpose that God has for you and me, for our planet, for all people, gathering all things, all people together in Christ. And we come to celebrate it as we break bread and drink wine. The heart, the very heart, celebrating the very centre of who God is. A lamb around which all gather, bearing the scars, inviting every tribe, language, people and nation to be there to worship and to be healed. Let's pray. Would you, dear God, in these moments for us, but for us as we go from this place later, and as we serve community and church, help us to be bearers of hope, filled with the spirit of wisdom and enlightenment, with a big vision, but the ability to see it writ very, very small, but importantly, in everyday life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.